Sziasztok! Ez itt a Kultúrasztal, a Golgota Rádió irodalmi és kultúrműsora. A mikrofonnál a műsor szerkesztő műsorvezetője, Majoros Szidónia. Good morning and welcome to Calvary Chapel Radio, Golgota Radio. This is... Uh, culture table, the the literature and culture oriented program on Golgota Radio. Today we have two guests, as you can see, we have Dr. Kornel Herjecki, the head of a Christian publishing house in Hungary called Harmat Kiadó. Welcome, Kornel. Welcome, everybody. And we also have a primary guest, Alice Potter, who is an author and a writer and uh, is here in Hungary and with us this time because uh, because we have just had a book festival in Budapest and the publishing house or the head of the publishing house um, basically invited Alice to, to be with us for the book festival. So we have Alice Potter in our midst. Welcome, Alice, in Hungary. Thank you very much. And welcome to the radio. We are very happy to have both of you here. Uh, let us go back in time first. And I'm asking you, Cornel, now, can you tell us a little bit about how you first got acquainted with Alice Potter and, and his, his works, his writing? Oh, um, Alice is a good friend and he came, as far as I remember, you came to Hungary uh, uh, around the 80s, or at least I met he you here uh, for the first time at the 80s. <coughs> That was during the socialist times. And in those years, we as university students came together and discussed issues which were not discussed, neither at the church, because they might be serious or in, too intellectual, nor at the universities, because they were Christian thoughts. So we tried to combine our faith and our knowledge. And in that aspect, Alice has been a big help for us, uh, representing that uh, there is such a species like Christian who is thinking. And uh, and we enjoyed uh, <laughs> listening to his lectures, and now, after so many years, uh, as I'm involved at the Harmat Publishing, which started out of these student initiatives, we have published uh, two of his titles, and now in in another way we are spreading these thoughts, uh, not only by the power of word, but also the written. Uh, word too. Sure, sure. Uh, do you also mean that during the communist times in Hungary there was no opportunity for, for Christian university students to share ideas? Was there no Bible study group or church community that you could go to? So why uh, was this meeting <clears throat> with Alice so special at the time? Well, that was very special because in those years, uh, late 70s, okay. uh, 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 not many Christian uh, students were at least even enrolled to universities. For example, uh, if someone was known that that he or she is a, is a Christian, that either he was just not allowed to come to the university, or if so, they were advised to go to a profession where they are not dealing with people, because they... they They, they know that if somebody is a Christian and is a teacher or a, a medical person, that he will deal with, deal with people. And that was a restriction. And during the 80s, there was a slight change in that. And more and more uh, Christians were there. But many Christians, because they got to know their professors, lost their faith. Because they have been receiving atheistic approach of sciences uh, and, and everything. And then when they went back to the churches uh, and they had questions, some of the pastors was just said, if you have questions, then you are not a serious Christian even. And for us, it was a relief to meet with other people, other students, where we were openly able to ask questions and answer them. And, and at the same time, we had a lot of questions where we had no answer. And in that sense, uh, uh, people like Alice w w was a big help because we understood in his life that he has gone through all of these questions we are asking. And uh, and in those years, at least we were not 
uh, having uh, too many people around us uh, who were helping uh, us in that sense. And Alice, how do you remember this first <coughs> period when you when you met when you met Cornell and and some other university students? V- were you an established speaker or writer at the time already, or or uh, what position were you in when you first came to Hungary? Mm-hmm. I was working in an evangelical study community in Switzerland. And I came with someone that I met who heard me lecture who was Hungarian and had gone out from Hungary in 56 Mm -hmm. and come to Switzerland. So I came with him, and uh, he had still family people here and church connections here, and he came often to, to try to help. My experience of the situation in the early 80s was of a great darkness and sadness. Mm -hmm. And everyone we visited, I was told by someone or other, we're going to visit this house, we're going into this flat in Budapest or some other city, and um, his uncle was killed in the war. Mm -hmm. Or his sister uh, had a serious problem. And in every case, there was some tragic information that was given to me why these people might be so sad and wounded as to be handicapped in every case. And so it was a situation of great woundedness and smashing of people and the culture as a whole. The people were very warm personally and very hospitable, and I enjoyed being with them, but there was a deep sadness. And what was your response to that? Were you trying to offer them some sort of a help or or um, encouragement? I'm not a psychologist <clears throat> and nor a medical doctor, but I I tried to make their lives more lively by engaging them in newness of ideas and helping them to become more like children in looking and hoping for truth and reality. Now, there's a crucial concept in in your writing, in your books, that any casual reader might might uh, experience, and the concept, uh, or which also functions, as I see, as a kind of starting point in your explanations of how you see the world and why you might be led to that particular thought, is pain pain and suffering uh, now that that uh, uh, concept came to my head when I was listening to you the the concept of pain uh, that you experienced the pain and suffering uh, of Hungarian people when you first visited mm-hmm. us uh, so is is this concept really so important in your life and in your 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 encounter with people I I don't know if I think of it as a concept, uh, perhaps rather it's just a fact of pain. That there is pain in the world. That there is pain in the world and in individual lives. And uh, some people have more than other people. And in some cases the pain is crippling in a variety of ways. Some people change the shape of their life by devoting themselves to never having that kind of pain again. And so they worship lack of pain as a god, Mm -hmm. and and they shape their whole life around not repeating that pain and protecting themselves from the pain, which is a handicap in my view, because it precludes trust and faith and openness and certain kinds of growth. But it is a natural reaction to pain, to not have it again. But that's that's crippling. I would contrast that with what I would call a spiritual reaction to pain, which is open to hope and is not self-centered, but other-centered, looking for the possibility that pain might be healed, that forgiveness might be possible, that new life might be available, which would relieve some of the handicaps that come from the pain. 
to what an extent do you see pain and suffering as universal uh, experiences of man? Does it matter what kind of pain we're talking about or which country or culture you visit when you when you see pain? Or is there still some sort of a difference in, in human experience depending on where we are in the world geographically or politically, for example? People in different parts of the world react to pain and deal with it differently, although everybody has pain in a variety of ways. Physical pain, psychological pain, emotional pain, existential pain, relational pain, the pain of being abandoned, the pain of being alone, the pain of being frustrated, the pain of failure. Everyone experiences a great variety of pain. And different cultures in different parts of the world deal with it in different ways. People in different philosophical and religious uh, modes of thought deal with it in different ways. Some people relieve the pain by moving into an awareness of oneness where there is no desire. Mm -hmm. And believing that pain causes suffering because we desire not to have it. Mm -hmm. We desire the pain to be relieved. But if we can eliminate desire from our lives, we are relieved of the pain. Mm -hmm. So that would be more functioning in some Asian cultures. In the Western culture, we would take a more active response to the pain and look for therapy of some kind or forgiveness of some kind or perhaps uh, seek relief in vengeance in, in some cases. So there would be different ways of reacting and coping depending on the, the philosophical understanding of the world, the worldview of, of the people. But do you agree with me if I I see uh, or can you accept when somebody says they see pain or suffering as crucial crucial ideas in your book something that that even led you when writing the book Again I must say I don't think pain is an idea but a fact mm. and crucial I'm not sure what crucial means um necessary, I, I hesitate to use the word necessary, I would say existing, mm -hmm. that it is a fact. Everyone has pain. Sure. So your book, um, your older book, uh, I, I mean older in the sense that it was published sooner okay. than a recent, the latest publication of yours in Hungarian is called Three Theories of Everything and we have the head of the publishing house with us. Why did you first choose to publish this book in Hungarian? Why did you think it could it could be relevant to to a Hungarian audience? I think Alice has the ability and that's his gift from God to to talk about very deep and and complex and big issues in a simple mm -hmm. way and I have never read such a short book which helped me to really understand the basic different ways of appro approaching the word or you call it reality in some ways and and I think nowadays uh, we are surrounded with so many philosophical thoughts and religions. Everything is here, so y you can have the Eastern religions and and animism and, and everything. And at the same time, the Christian worldview is just think thinking in Europe, and 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 especially young people consider that as a dead option because they have never met somebody who is lively understanding the, the, the situation uh, and and when I read that I understood <coughs> that this this book uh, will be a big help for those who are interested in and, and would like to see in in a, a united way the, the the possibilities of choosing one and the others and and I also highly uh, value this title because uh, there is such a respect to all sorts of 
views expressed that there is nothing uh, 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 to to just make sure that you only have to choose this one. It's your choice which one mm. you choose, but have a clear understanding the options. And I think this book... That there are options. There are options, mm -hmm. and you have to know why you choose it. And also the second mm. half of the book uh, are answers to particular questions, which are, I think is very unique also of the book. So when I've read that, I, I, I was sure that uh, this should be uh, distributed to our Hungarian people and uh, to help that, even to saturate that knowledge, uh, we invited uh, Alice to introduce the book in Hungarian when it was published and um, and and since then uh, people who have read that are very committed, although it's not a huge amount, or huge numbers because just simply people sometimes do not think uh, about issues like that but those who has read that became very committed to it in the beginning of the book you write that um, in your search or in your quest for for knowledge or deeper understanding of life um, perhaps you you uh, find that or anybody who goes on a quest for the meaning of life or why we are here might might find your book useful mm -hmm. because because this this can be a, a kind of shared or common common thread in our lives that at some stage perhaps most people want to find out why we are here or what's the meaning of life can you tell us a little bit about your quest for the meaning of life if somebody reads your book they have an idea about certain parts in your history but can you tell us a little bit uh, about your your background what kind of a family were you born into were you taught for example to to have a to have an interest in the world or is it is it um, um, uh, some 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 sort of a genuine uh, interest that you you have developed on your own It's a genuine interest that I have developed on my own. Mm -hmm. And and how did you start out first to to find out about the meaning of life? What I, path did you choose? I started um, as a young child by asking absolute questions like how high is up? How far is far? How small is small? I can remember when I was nine exploring the reality of thankfulness because I had taught, I'd been taught to be thankful when, when I was a child. And I was taught that we should be thankful to God when I was a child. And so I began to explore in my mind what it means to be thankful. And what I was, I'm, I've always been interested in absolutes. I've always been interested in coming to the circumference of reality. And I wanted to know how can we be fully thankful and be finished with thankfulness? How can we manage to be thankful? And so I would say, thank you, God, for my bicycle. And then I thought a bit more deeply and I thought, Well, then, thank you, God, that I am able to say thank you. Uh, thank you, God, that I am able to say thank you for being able to say thank you. And then I realized it's eternal. It doesn't end. It's it's a living reality that goes on. We don't finish. Like you, we can always ask new questions. No. We, we must always be thankful without oh, okay. ceasing. We never accomplish thankfulness. Mm. Mm. We never draw a line and mm. say, now I am done with being thankful. I have successfully, mm -hmm. fully been thankful mm -hmm. and I can move on to other things. It is an eternal living reality of thankfulness. And that was important for me to see that things are not in discrete packages all the time, but some things are open-ended in life. And then why did you choose religions to, to help you find out about perhaps deeper meanings 
uh, in life? I grew up with religious people who uh, were in, engaged in a church. And so that was my natural beginning. And I asked a lot of questions as a child and as a young teenager that the Christians that I knew could not answer. And in some cases, I was told, you should have faith like a little child and not ask questions. Well, of course, anyone realizes that there are no little children who don't ask questions. It's their job. It's what they do all day long. And so if you, true. if you want to be like a little child, then you have to ask questions. If you stop asking questions, you're no longer a little child. So that was, frankly, nonsense to me. And I thought, in Christianity, there is no truth. There are nice people, and there's a sociological system and community that works existentially in a variety of ways, but no one is interested in truth. So I began to explore in different groups of people who were interested in truth. And I visited the Baha'is and the Society for Research and Enlightenment of Edgar Cayce and the Rosicrucian Society. I grew up in California, mm -hmm. and the Rosicrucian Society was headquartered in San Jose. And the Self-Realization Fellowship of Paramahansa Yogananda and a, a variety of major influential works that were going on at the time in the... 60s, 60s of, we're talking of, about. Of, of the okay. last of okay. the last century mm -hmm. and some of them were very religious specifically religious and some of them were more philosophical existential ways of trying to know and live reality and and truth early on i developed an interest in zen buddhism and eventually became a Zen Buddhist monk. And there were various things that attracted me to that. One is the Zen Buddhists are always interested in absolutes. Mm -hmm. They always want to find the bottom line, the absolute circumference of reality, the complete context of an activity or a being. And that was very attractive to me. I wanted to know the truth. and. I did not have an agenda. If the truth would turn out to be death, I would have it, whatever the truth was. I didn't have an idea of what I thought the truth should be like. I thought if I did have an idea of what the truth should be like, I would not find the truth, I would find myself. And I didn't trust myself to, to know and to be truth. I wanted to have a larger truth than myself. And so I was rather open to whatever the truth might be, that is what I will have. And if it's something I like, fine. If it's something I don't like, fine. It is the truth, that is reality, and I will have it. Could you accept everything that Buddhism, that Zen Buddhism uh, was teaching? Zen Buddhism basically teaches nothing. And that's a rather simple concept and rather deep and rather universal. And I accepted it. And what made you um, choose to take a look at different paths once you once you became a Zen Buddhist? In other words, why didn't you remain a Zen Buddhist? Ah, I was traveling in Europe, visiting monasteries where they were practicing Zen meditation. And I met an old friend who was a Christian and have, had heard of a community in Switzerland called Labri Fellowship that was started by Francis Schaeffer. Mm. And he wanted to visit this community. And I asked him about it, what is it? And he said, it's a community of Christians and they think. And I said, no. And he said, well, that's what he'd heard. And he'd read a couple of books and he thought they were thoughtful. And so he, he uh -huh. really wanted to visit there. So I went with him. And 
I was not dissatisfied with Zen Buddhism. It was really the best thing I had found so far, the most honest, the deepest, the broadest, the clearest, the most consistent view uh, and way of behaving that I had found uh, so far. And we came to La Brie and I didn't like it because people talked all the time. It was very noisy. And my concept of spiritual pursuit was involving a lot of silence and there just wasn't a lot of silence. And so I went to Italy for four months and I studied the tea ceremony in Rome with the Michiko Nojiri and visited monasteries and traveled around. And then I went back to La Brie because my friend was still there and I was tired of trying to speak Italian. And also I thought that some of the ideas I had heard at La Brie were dangerously wrong and someone should go and help these people. Oh, right. <laughs> so I went in a way as a missionary of Zen Buddhism to Francis Schaeffer and the La Brie community. And it turns out I'm a very bad missionary because I got converted instead of the other way around. And I became a student at La Brie and I asked a lot of questions, which made a very painful time for everybody. It was painful for me to ask the questions and it was painful for the teachers and workers at La Brie to try to deal with the questions that I was asking. But I, I knew people who were Christians and I could see that these people were genuinely thinking and interested in the kinds of questions that I thought were important. And so I studied uh, their thought and their ideas. So that was when exactly? When you first visited Labri? That was 1975. And what changed you? What direction did you, did you take after that? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. I mean, after this experience with Christians, that you realized that there were still Christians who, who, who were thinkers, who had an interest in, in, in your ideas as well. Uh, did that realization make you, make you want to spend more time with them or even write for them? Um, or did that experience change you in any way? I don't know that that experience changed me in any particular way, but the Holy Spirit did hmm. change me profoundly. I became a Christian at La Brie, and then I stayed at La Brie for 16 years, working in La Brie, and met my wife and married, and we both lived in the community. So I, I became fully engaged in the work of La Brie. Do you live nearby now? No, uh, La Brie is in the southwestern part of Switzerland, the French-speaking part of Switzerland. And in 1991, I moved to Basel to be a pastor for an international church in Basel. And I still live in Basel. But you also visit Hungary very often. Uh, yes. <laughs> and, and that's why you are here with us. Uh, so as we mentioned earlier, your, your first book published in Hungarian, Three Theories of Everything, actually um, was, was published in Hungarian some five, six years ago. Am I right? Uh, rather four. Four years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, four years ago. So that may be considered as, as a relatively recent publication as well uh, in Hungary. Sorry, uh, it's only three years ago, three oh. years ago, <laughs> but it looks f <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> it, lo it, it seems to be a long time. Uh, who is the primary audience of, of three theories of everything? Who would you dedicate the book to or recommend the book, the book to? Well, for a publisher, it's always a question whether we are able to reach uh, the, the group of uh, people who are interested in that topic and it should be uh, expressed in the style we uh, talk about, uh, the, the cover design and everything. Uh, 
With this title, I would think uh, the target audience is really anybody who thinks about a possible option of thinking about life uh, and reality or truth, different options of word views to choose from, and, um, and, and, and just being people who are either interested in Christianity but they are not sure, or they grew up in a Christian background and uh, because they have experienced different distractions from all sorts of worldview and people and they became unsure whether they really want to be there or or is there a reason uh, why why to stay there and and they have these questions that's the target audience in my understanding Alice, would you add anything? Who would you recommend three theories of everything for? I would recommend three theories of everything to anybody, as Cornell would, and in a sense specifically to Christians who have not thought very broadly and would be willing to think more broadly, and Christians who have contact with and love non-Christians who have a variety of ideas that may or may not be in focus and consistent. The, the main purpose of the book is to equip Christians to love their neighbors, beginning through understanding their neighbors and being able to deal with their neighbors as their neighbors actually are, rather than as the Christians fantasize about them. <laughs> Well, I hope that, that the book will find its readers, the proper audience then. Thank you very much for, for being with us today and sharing some, uh, something of, of your background and, and your life and, and also uh, of the book. And we also want to thank our viewers and listeners for joining us today. Uh, if you have questions that you would like to ask from our guests, or if you have any comments or questions regarding the program itself, you can write us. We are available online. We have a Facebook page called Kulturasta. Feel free to ask your questions and write us there. And the program also has a, uh, an internet address. It's kulturastal at gmail.com. Uh, any any questions or comments are welcome. Uh, otherwise, we wish you a lot of joy for the upcoming days, and and we hope to see you again next time. May you be blessed. Goodbye. Mm-hmm.